Welcome to Chatting the Pictures. My name is Kara Finnegan, and I'm a writer, teacher, and historian of photography. And I'm Michael Shaw. I'm a writer, a psychologist, and also the publisher of Reading the Pictures. Our first segment we call The News, and here we're interested in how news photos tell a story. This photo is a handout from Tyson Foods, and it shows its poultry processing plant in Camilla, Georgia. The press release with the recent photo notes how workers are wearing protective masks and stand between plastic dividers to protect against the coronavirus. If you've been following this part of the coronavirus story, it's really blowing up right now, the whole controversy over meatpacking plants and a lot of infections that are breaking out. The Tyson plant has 2,000 workers, and it has suffered four deaths from the virus. Many others are sick and in quarantine. One of the workers who died told her family she was ordered back to work while suffering symptoms, and workers claim that they've been pushed by insults and humiliation to work beyond their limits. Camilla is 30 miles from Albany, Georgia, where a funeral at the end of February led to a significant virus cluster. The population of the town is about 5,600, 2,000 people working at the plant, and it's also 66% African American. And uh, of course, the Tyson plant is the largest employer. Tyson released this photo presumably to highlight its social distancing practices and its safety practices. As you mentioned, the masks, the thin screens between each worker designed to keep them separated. Other photos they released showed kind of workers sitting in these set off socially distanced cubes in what looks like a break room. You can notice all of that. And that yet the devil is in the details because this virus goes floor to ceiling and these flimsy screens between workers don't. The context that you highlighted in this plant in a town where this is clearly an economic driver, you know, I think really hits at the core of this ongoing public conversation about safety versus economics. And I think in this image, it really condenses that conversation in such a way as to suggest that safety and economics aren't or maybe shouldn't be separate. Yeah, it's a deceivingly elegant photo, isn't it? And of course, they created it, so you would expect that. It has this order to it, this symmetry, the colors are interesting. You have to think about it as like their best face forward and then just keep going from there. Obviously, it's impersonal. It shows these workers clustered together very tightly. The woman second from left, you can see her arm moving to operate some kind of a cutter or some other device. And she's practically touching the woman to her right. My eye keeps getting drawn to the top left to that screen, which I assume is tied to the manufacturing in the processing plant. There's a yellow light, there's some green lights, there's a red light, there's a screen displaying. Presumably these have really specific meanings in the context of what the workers are doing in this plant. But thinking of this as we should, as a kind of public relations image, those red and green and yellow lights are a little disturbing and a little haunting, given that we know deaths of employees have occurred at this plant. And given that we know the kind of work that takes place in these contexts. This photo is actually educate you about that. In addition to being a kind of performance of Tyson's attempt at social distancing and safety, this appears to be largely a group of women, many of whom are people of color. You can see them standing on mats. Uh, They're wearing very heavy rubber boots. They're obviously covered in aprons. And then you can see in the bottom middle of the image, the remnants of what it is that they're processing, right? Maybe that's chicken. So the photo also gives you a lot of information about what happens at this place. That also, I think, needs to be understood and recognized, that the workers here are doing a really hard job. There's even more clues, actually, to the larger industry problems. As you said, you know, you can just get the hint of chicken. You do not see the assembly line. You also do not see any eye protection. We're looking also at a photo of an industry that has consolidated terrifically over the last few years so that the nation's food supply is now in the hands of relatively few companies that can kind of call their own shots. Also, OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration budget, was slashed soon after President Trump took office. And now they have the fewest number of inspectors in their history. The CDC and OSHA only issued guidelines this past Sunday calling for physical distancing and other safety measures in these plants. But remarkably, the guidelines are voluntary. 
We've talked a lot about medical professionals. Yet in this image, doesn't their head covering and some of the aprons they're wearing and the fact that they're wearing masks, doesn't that look a little bit like PPE? We've come to think about this idea of essential workers and people who need to be kept safe so they can continue to do their job. And I think that's a great point because this photograph also illustrates how much the definition of the critical worker has been turned on his head. Although Trump's been hesitant to use it for higher tech industries, yesterday he invoked the Defense Production Act to order meat processing plants to stay open by declaring them critical infrastructure. That's in spite of the fact that at least 13 plants around the country right now have been shut down several times since March. Are these critical workers in terms of the nomenclature? Yes. If someone has to die to put burgers in the fast food places and food on the table, that's what's going to happen. Our next segment, The Look, looks at how photographs push the visual boundaries to illuminate a story or an idea. This photograph was taken by John Moore for Getty Images. The photo was taken April 2nd, and we see emergency medical technicians in Stamford, Connecticut, checking a woman in her apartment for COVID-19 symptoms. On the TV is one of the presidential task force briefings. The medics came after she fell down and couldn't get back up, but she showed no signs of the virus. And at the time, Stanford had more than a thousand confirmed coronavirus cases, the most of any city in Connecticut. John has done a whole series riding along with EMT technicians in the Northeast and in Connecticut. There's so many images that are just really powerful. This is grandma's house, isn't it? I mean, there's just so much visual detail that says grandma's house to me. The bric-a-brac, the plants, the keepsakes, the flowers, the little family photos, the feather boa, you know, maybe left over from some party or celebration, festively draped over the television. That visual detail of John Moore's work that you mentioned is just really on display here. And it's on display in a really interesting way because... The photograph initially invites you to look at the television and look at Trump. And only after you've kind of processed that, do you then follow his gaze over to the left of the screen where we see the resident of this home or this apartment being treated by the first responders, being checked on and taken care of. And that to me is a really interesting juxtaposition. The radical specific visual detail of this woman's life and these televised performances, you might call them spectacles, playing out. And they're playing out in real time in front of us, the viewer, simultaneously. And I find that really compelling. The photo really does capture the disconnect between the American public, domestic life, and then what's going on in Washington. You couldn't get a better representation of that. And let's admit it, didn't we all look at the bug in the right corner of that TV screen to see what she's watching? Yeah, it's kind of a sad commentary on our political polarization that that was the first thing I checked for. Is it Fox? Is it MSNBC? And then when you think about how, for example, all the states are being left to fend for themselves and we're seeing a difference in aid being doled out between blue states and red states, we're seeing completely different narrative about science and facts of the crisis based on what broadcast you're receiving. So it turns out to be a pretty salient thing to attend to. I'm also struck by the fact that the left side of the image where we see those healthcare workers helping the resident, it's fuzzy, you know, and John Moore's a pretty good photographer. I don't think he just did that because he doesn't know how to make a picture, right? That the choice to focus in literally on that television and to highlight and kind of construct that visual juxtaposition, what it also does is it kind of points to the way that things in the real world are fuzzier, right? And that the kind of confident, although ever-changing assertions that we've been getting in these national level briefings, especially, those are presented as sharp and clear and decisive. And yet the left side of the image highlights a whole range of ways in which that isn't the case. I think the fact that the woman in the photo has suffered a fall and does not have COVID actually amplifies that point because what it suggests is the frailty of everybody and particularly the frailty of older people who are already wrestling with so many changes and so many difficulties. And then now this gets layered on on top of it. Our next segment we call The Pick. And here we're interested in what makes a photo a good editorial choice among many. This photograph was made by Elizabeth Frazier from the U.S. Army. So we have another handout photograph here and it was distributed by Getty Images. The photo shows soldiers assigned to the Special Military Affairs 
Old Guard doing honors during the funeral of Army Sergeant Major Robert Belch at Arlington National Cemetery. The ceremony was held April 14th, and Belch died in a Virginia nursing home on January 17th. The World War II veteran served in the Army for 26 years. We've talked a lot in these last several episodes about how this global pandemic has turned common rituals or practices or images into uncommon ones. And this, I think, is a a really stark illustration of that point. The traditional military funeral involves a highly choreographed set of rituals, an elaborate folding ritual, which you see beginning in this photograph. There are rifle salutes, taps is played. It's an extremely choreographed context in regular times. And what this photograph is showing is the way that that has been adapted. Arlington National Cemetery has been closed to the public visitors. It's been closed, but they have allowed funerals like this to continue, but they've kind of changed and shifted a little bit over the last several weeks. So that when this funeral took place, the family was allowed in a small group to stay near the graveside, socially distanced. But now people are being asked to be even more distant and to stay in their cars and on the roads rather than come up to the gravesite. You are seeing all kinds of tortured adjustments. You have people in Louisiana, for example, who have been sitting in front of their houses with photographs of their loved one while people drive by in cars, paying their respects. You are seeing pallbearers in Tyvek suits. It's really one of the more painful and torturous effects of the coronavirus, not being able to say goodbye properly. If the members of this honor guard were not wearing the masks, this would be just another picture of another highly choreographed military ritual burial of a veteran. The mask really is a symbol. And here, to me, what is really compelling about it is, first of all, that it's black. So it has been made funereal. And that itself signifies, you know, in a broader sense, the context we're living in where many people are dying. The other part of the photo that I'm really struck by is the way that the photographer has positioned us as the viewer. It is almost as if we are also a member of the honor guard. It puts us kind of up close inside of this ritual and the flag beginning to be folded, kind of bisecting the image, I think really amplifies that. Thanks for joining us. We will be back soon with hopefully images that reflect a broader visual landscape and maybe one that is slowly becoming safer and perhaps less socially distant. You can find us on Reading the Pictures on Instagram, Reading the Pics at Twitter. You can visit us on our completely new website, readingthepictures.org, and we'll see you again in two weeks.